my oldest son came to me several years ago and he said, Dad, you need a strong online presence. And I said, okay. He said, so what you need is a LinkedIn account. I said, all right. So I gave my son my bio and he gave me life online. And I became, he said, he assured me, I was an early adopter of LinkedIn at number 90 million. <laughs> and uh, are you impressed? Well, there's, there's, even, there's even people on LinkedIn that are, that are really impressive because they are called the influencers. You know, people like Bill Gates and Meg Whitman and... Um, uh, Jamie Dimon and, and other, other folks uh, that are leaders in their various different industries. And they have, um, each of them, over a million people that follow them. Follow them and that's impressive. Uh, maybe some of you are influencers. Um, I would suggest that probably um, you are influencers more than you realize. I look around this room, I see people who are so influential in so many different ways. And one of the things that the book of James tells us is if you are an influencer or if you are a would-be influencer, don't go too fast. Watch out. Don't rush, the text says, to be a teacher. Because with that authority comes great responsibility. And one of the things that James tells us is if you're going to be a teacher, you also need wisdom. Brian sang for us today about joy and embracing joy kind of as, as an individual in our heart. Embrace her. Um, Bono of YouTube talks about grace, walking down the street and embracing her. And in the book of uh, Proverbs, we're told that wisdom walks down the street and we need to embrace her. And so many people think, well, if I only could be impressive and influential on other people, um, then I would, I would just be so important. And James says, slow down, not too fast. He says, if you're gonna be an influencer, if you're gonna be a teacher, make sure you have not just knowledge, but make sure that you have wisdom. And as it's described in the Bible, both Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, wisdom is something that is filled with truth and also grace. Now oftentimes we think, well, I have a lot of knowledge because I've got a, a title to my name. I'm the Reverend Doctor. Or I'm a professor or I'm a judge. And we have all these different initials that we place after our names. PhD, MDiv, DMIN, MA, MS, BA, and my favorite, BS. <laughs> and one of the things that James says is, you know, we have all these different titles, but just be careful. Don't be in a rush to be a teacher. Because if you're a teacher, you need to have both truth, and know a lot about truth, but also be filled with grace. And then he defines grace for us in the text. He gives us this powerful passage of scripture in verse 17 where he says, wisdom that is from above, James says, is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good works, good fruit, unwavering, without hypocrisy. You see, for James, not only is it important that you have knowledge and truth, but you need to have grace and character as well. And then he goes into the depth of defining what that character looks like. It's gonna be pure. Pure is something that is the same on the outside as it is on the inside. It's the same through and through. It has integrity. And we'll have integrity if we are a person who's going to be wise. 
You know, some people want to brag about their IQ or their SAT or, or their GPA, but James is telling us, hey, let's have a good, not IQ, not even EQ that a lot of psychologists are talking about, but let's have a good WQ, wisdom quotient. And that means that you're gonna be pure, integrated through and through. There was a, a woman back in the days, Mary Wills, Mary, some, I forget her name exactly. She's an African-American kind of soul singer. She had a song that was called, um, I Have Two Lovers. Anybody remember that song from back in the day? I, my wife and I heard, heard her singing this on an oldies station we were listening to on Pandora or some, somewhere. And she says, I have two other lovers and I'm not ashamed. And she said, one of them is mean and, 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 he's, and he's always rude and, and he's strong but he's crude. And the other one is nice and pleasant and kind. And she says, I have two lovers. And then she said, you, you have a split personality and you are one and the same lover. And yet you could hear in the song, there's this longing that, that those two different people would actually be one man instead of having that split personality. And I think one of the things that women are crying out for, even today, you read about it in the news every day, we need a, a, a world filled with men who are pure through and through. Women are crying for it. They're begging for it. And the scripture says, if you are wise, you'll be pure. Now, in addition to this, this quality of, of grace and impurity, another thing that James says, we'll also be peaceable. In other words, we won't stir up anger. You know, some people just like to fight. You know, people like that, they just, they just like to pick a fight. It's like everything is peaceful and they're just gonna find some way to stir things up. My sister was that way, Nancy. I've mentioned her, but I tell you, I'd be sitting in the car, just minding my own business, not doing a single thing wrong. And she would just like reach over and pinch me for no reason. And, and some people are like that. Now, Nancy has grown up. She, she's a disciple of Jesus Christ now, and thank the Lord. She's a lovely Christian lady. But you know, some people don't grow up. Some people are just agitators and for some reason they just are not peaceable and what James is calling us to is to have that kind of quality it's 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 a wisdom that's willing to embrace peace Jesus says you know blessed are the peacemakers and also James his brother says be gentle be gentle in other words uh, another translation of that in many scriptures is be considerate you know, the wife is sitting in the living room and the husband is sitting in the living room and she says, you know, I'm a little bit hot. And he says, no, you're not. It's cold in here. And she says, no, no, it's not. It's hot. And he says, no, it's cold. Who's right? She is, right, okay. <laughs> The, the, the reality is, the reality is, wrong. they're both right. She's hot for her and he's, he's cold for him. You know, turn the air conditioner on, somebody put on a sweater. You know, it's, it's just be considerate with one another. That's the wise thing to do. So be reasonable, be gentle, be, be a, a peacemakers. And you know this word reasonable in, in the text of scripture that James says, he's really talking about a, a tender strength. No people with tender strength are wise people. I knew a man like this, Bob Munger. He was a, a minister in a church where I served, and he was such a, a, a leader around the, the world in Christianity, and everybody just looked up to him. He's got copies of, of his works, you know, 60 million of them spread all over the place in 30 different languages, and just a really wonderful guy. Well, I was in a study that he was leading. Every week, he, he took the young pastors and, and led us in a study, and on one occasion, Bob Munger came up to me, and he said, Steve, I wanna ask your opinion on this family matter. And he had a family situation, and he sought my wisdom. 
And I thought, wow, I must be really wise <laughs> for Bob Munger to ask me. But the reality is Bob Munger is the one that was wise to be willing to gain wisdom from a younger buck, from somebody else that was less mature. He knew that he could still grow, and that's the wise thing to do. Well, in our scripture today, James says, be wise. Don't just be in a hurry to demonstrate your influence, but have true good influence, full of mercy and good fruits. You know, some, some people will be um, just merciless in the way that they show off their intellectual abilities. I had a professor once, basically, you'd sit in class and you'd, you'd sit there, and if you didn't have the right answer, he would basically call you an idiot because you would feel like an idiot. And, and there, there's, unfortunately, some of us parents can communicate the same thing to our children as well. You know, a two-year-old is going to act like a two-year-old, and we want them to have perfect behavior. We want them to have perfect speech. We want them to behave themselves in perfect ways. But sometimes when you just expect perfection and you're constantly harping with merciless expectations of, expection, of, of perfection, you know you're not going to get perfection. You know what you're going to get? Neuroses. That's the result. Psychologists will tell us. It's true. And so the thing that James is telling us is if we're going to be wise, we're going to embrace mercy and, and have those kinds of fruits of kindness and grace in our life. And we're also going to be both unwavering and without hypocrisy, he tells us. And the, those, those words, both of those words, are, are, have as their root the Greek word krito, which means face. And in both words, he's telling us that we should not have multiple faces, but that we should be one. Actors would be kritos, hypocritos. They would have various different masks they would put up in front of their face. They would wear different costumes. They would be different people. But for God's sake, James is saying, be one person. Don't be a split personality. God wants to love you as one. And he wants the world to see his love through you as, as one, pure and peaceable and gentle and reasonable and full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. And we want our influence to go out there, but James says, listen, don't be too much in a rush because you folks who are teachers, it's a dangerous thing to be doing that. In fact, in the early church, the, the early teachers took on the similar role to the rabbi in the church when they became a, a teacher and a leader. And you know, in, in, the, in the early Jewish setting, the rabbi was called my great one. That's what it literally means, my great one. And in, in the Jewish setting, if you were a rabbi in a synagogue, then you were the one who was considered to be the wisest one in the synagogue. And there was a debate within Judaism about individuals who were um, um, the rabbi, and if the rabbi and the parent um, were together, which one was more important? And you know who the rabbi said was more important, right? The rabbi. In fact, they said, they taught this. They said, look, your parents introduce you to life, but the rabbi introduces you to life eternal. They would teach that if, if there was a war and the rabbi and the parents were uh, captured, then it would be your responsible, responsibility to first ransom the rabbi first. And the point that James is making is this kind of responsibility can ruin a person. And it does, and it has. Jesus spoke worlds of of criticism of some of the teachers of his day. These would be people who would be fine, polished ornaments of hypocritical piety. And James says, so look, your influence shouldn't be so much your influence. What it needs to be is wise. And the true wisdom comes from God. You know, I might want to assert myself and my wisdom. 
but really, I don't need to have my way. James is saying, you want God's way. And so he says, use words of life with one another. Now, we don't have time to go into all the, the, the descriptions of, of the power of words that James talks about here, but, I mean, to go back and read what James says about the power of the influential words that you speak. Words can, can have tremendous power. It can be like a horse, the bit in a horse. Your single word can influence a whole group of people. Not only is it like a, a horse's bit, it can be like a rudder on a ship. Your words can have influence to steer a whole group of people in a positive direction or in a negative direction. Watch your words. James says your words can be like a fire that burns. You've seen fires around here, right? On the hillsides? We had a fire in Thousand Oaks. You know who it was started by? A little boy with matches. Cute little guy, but very dangerous when he had matches in his hands. I know of a pastor that had to confront a woman who would just make up stuff in the church and just say stuff. And she said, well, I was just talking. Well, she was cute, but words aren't just talking. It can start a whole fire. It's like a little boy with matches it can start a whole hillside on fire. So James warns us, our words of influence can actually be from the pit of hell. So watch it. How should, the, how should our influence be? Our influence should be like living water that pours out, giving fresh garden, watering on people around us. That's what our influence can be. And our words can be words of life to one another. Now, has anybody ever blown it? Anybody ever say a word that you wish you could take back? I think we all do. The minute it's out your mouth, you can't get it back. Just like a, a simple fire that sparks. You can't get, go get that spark that you've started back. It's going to light up a whole forest, and it'll take a whole battalion of firefighters to put it out. This isn't to make us guilty, but this is to make us to come to Jesus to confess our sins, to know that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we can then listen to God's wonderful words of life and then as we listen to God's wonderful words of life in our own lives, then we'll start pouring out the beauty of his words to others. I love what Jesus said to the woman at the well in Samaria. He said, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you would ask him, and he would give you the Holy Spirit, and from inside of you would spring up wells of living water. That's what our life of influence can be. Just sharing love and grace, truth and mercy to those around us.